Okay, for our second session of the morning, we're going to focus specifically on that unpronounceable trade agreement, the CPTPP, uh, which we've already talked quite a bit about today, but uh, we're going to take a deeper dive on it. Um, let me introduce our very distinguished panel. So on my far left, uh, probably these people need no introduction, but I'll just run through the highlights anyway. Jeff Nankovell, uh, the president of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, longtime uh, a public servant working mostly in CETA and global affairs. Uh, served, Jeff served three postings in Beijing. He's a fluent Chinese speaker uh, and including uh, as a position of deputy head of mission and from 2016 to 2021 was Canada's consul general in Hong Kong. And then to his right is Dan Churiak, who is a fellow in residence at the C.D. Howe Institute in Ottawa, also C.G. CG and APFC Fellow, uh, former Deputy Chief Economist at Foreign Affairs and International Trade, now Global Affairs, of course, and is Principal of Churiak Consulting. Dan, as many of you know, has done a great deal of modeling work on free trade agreements. Uh, next is Tim Sargent, who is a CG Distinguished Fellow, spent almost 30 years in the public service as well, including two Deputy Minister appointments as the Deputy of DFO and of International Trade. Um, and as what I used to call it, the DMT, I'm not sure what the acronym is these days, was closely involved with uh, three key trade negotiations, KUSMA, CETA, and the CPTPP. Uh, Tim is now focused on, uh, is focusing on implementation of digital technology uh, for the global economy. And finally, we've already uh, Diana has already done some heavy lifting as chair of our previous panel, but another experienced Foreign Service officer, currently a fellow at the Monk Centre at the University of Toronto, where she's done work on can Canadian commercial presence in Asia. Uh, Diana served at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, 12 years on different postings in Japan, including as Deputy Head of Mission and as Canada's Ambassador to Vietnam, Socialist Republic of Vietnam. So uh, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. I have asked our four panelists uh, to speak on kind of around four questions, so I'm not sure exactly what they're going to say, and then we'll come back to some interactivity on the panel and then go to, uh, to Q&A in the audience. But what I asked them to, th to think about, of course, is we're now at this period where the UK accession is virtually complete. Uh, the UK has not carried out all of its domestic uh, requirements to accede fully, but is basically there. But the last time I talked to an official who was still a working official about what's going to happen next, the answer was, oh, well, we still have to wait for the UK to complete its succession process. Well, let's, let's assume that's done. So uh, now that the UK is out of the way, which was always the response, we have to deal with the UK first. Um, what are the considerations that the current members of the CPTPP need to take into account in dealing with pending applications, particularly China and Taiwan? And then what would be the strategic considerations for Canada in evaluating these accession bids, particularly in light of what we have discussed in the earlier panel of economic security and so on? Uh, and particularly since, as was mentioned, Canada is the chair of the process this year. Last year it was New Zealand, next year it's Australia. Uh, what role does the chair have? Uh, can Canada play a, a role in moving it forward? Should it, what should it do as chair? And uh, particularly given what we all recognize, the unspoken truth of the, of the political impasse between China and Taiwan in terms of accession, um, are there creative solutions? There are some precedents, of course, the WTO, APEC, uh, but are there ways in which we could sort of get over this hump? So those are the four questions I asked them to think about, so we'll see what they have to say, and then we'll come back to some specific questions. So uh, why don't we start on my far left with uh, Jeff? Okay, on the, over here on the far left, uh, let, let me say, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks to, to IPD and, and thanks uh, for the Taiwan Economic and Cultural Office for uh, this the terrific event and it's very, very timely that we're discussing these things. Um, I, I would say, um, first of all, um, a kind of a starting point for 
for a discussion about the accession issues around CPTPP um, uh, from a Canadian perspective has, you know, a key starting point is the desirability of finding a way to get uh, Taiwan into uh, CPTPP. You know, there's this saying that comes out of American politics uh, that uh, everything that has that needs to be said has been said, but not everyone has said it. So let me add, <laughs> let me add my my voice to say, um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's kind of a no-brainer that uh, the nature of Taiwan's economy, its institutions, the preparation work that has been done over over more than half a decade now, uh, very deliberately um, by those institutions. Um, this is, a, you know, it, it's, a, it's an excellent candidate economy for CPTPP. And the, the stated principles and ambitions of CPTPP as an agreement are to, to welcome economies uh, that, can, that can meet its uh, standards. And um, so, you know, it, it is, so my point number one would be this would, this would be a good thing to achieve for the members of CPTPP and, and specifically for, for Canada. This is, this is a desirable thing. Uh, Taiwan uh, is, uh, I think, growing in its economic importance to, to many uh, partners around the world. Uh, that is definitely true of Canada. Um, from Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada perspective, that's not just something we say. We are also going to be bringing a trade mission uh, later this year uh, to Taiwan. For, uh, for the last uh, four years, we have run a series of uh, women-only business missions uh, with support from the Government of Canada to various destinations in Asia. Uh, we, we just a, a few months ago did a mission to Thailand and to South Korea. Um, and we announced uh, last week that our next missions would be to Vietnam and to Taiwan in the, in the autumn of this year. Um, uh, so Taiwan's uh, greater integration into economic institutions regionally and globally is, a, is something that is, that is desirable and, uh, and should be part of, of Canadian uh, policy. Um, and, and Taiwan, among the assets that Taiwan brings to its, uh, its application for accession to the TPP, uh, CPTPP is that it, it has existing uh, trade agreements uh, with, with uh, two of the members, with New Zealand and Singapore. Um, it, it will become important later in the discussion to note that both of those countries already had, this was about a decade ago that these agreements were signed, and both of those countries already had free trade agreements in place with the People's Republic of China at the time that they negotiated these economic agreements, which are not referred to as FTAs, but as economic cooperation agreements. But, you know, there's, there's certainly a basis, a basis there, uh, you know, from which to work. I, I think for those of us who, who are, have been studying these issues, and, and I'm, you know, there's a lot of expertise in this room on this, I think pretty quickly you come around, though, to the challenge of achieving consensus. I think that's really, that's really the, key, uh, the key issue here when we look at the problems, uh, when we look at the opportunities and the issues around accession to the CPTPP. There, as you've heard this morning, there are six, uh, six economies that, that have lodged applications. Um, the earliest going back already two and a half years now, when the, the uh, PRC, uh, followed very closely by Taiwan, uh, in September of 2021, lodged applications. But there's, there's four more in the queue now. And, uh, and it, it, it was part of the original CPTPP agreement. It's worth remembering that, that the agreement would be open to new partners to join, and that if applications were received, that they would be dealt with in a reasonable period of time. Um, uh, and I think, you know, two and a half years is, is getting to the bounds of, of reasonable. And as we've heard, um, to say that the UK accession uh, is taking up the, you know, absorbing the energies of the CPTPP members, um, we can no longer really say that about the accession. Although I think you, you will have heard some spokespersons saying um, we're now taken up with the implementation of the UK's accession and issues around that. But you know, it's time to get moving on uh, some kind of a process for considering uh, accession. But, but there are big challenges. And, and you know, the, the elephant in the room is, is about 
how to deal with uh, the application uh, from uh, People's Republic of China and, from, and the application from Taiwan. Uh, this, is, this is the issue that CPTPP members are confronted with. I think if you want a preview of the kinds of issues that come up, you can look at what has what, uh, happened uh, in the last two years with the American initiative, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF initiative of the United States, uh, where, where uh, uh, a judgment was made. There are 14 uh, countries, the US and, and, uh, and 13 partners across Asia in, in this. It's not, as I think people are, around the room know, it's not, it's not an FTA, it's a, it's a framework. There's all kinds of constraints. Uh, trade, you know, access to, to markets is not something that the US can, administration can offer. Um, but Taiwan was not included in, the, in those discussions, and if you read the you know, speculation as to, as, to, as to why that is, you, you quickly come across the geopolitics and the, and the issues that come into play. And so I think the biggest challenge is, is to find a way to move forward um, that, that can build a consensus to expand the CPTPP in a way that serves the members' interests in the way that strengthens uh, the, the, the agreement as a, as a regional trade liberalizing agreement. Um, and, uh, and I think we, we do have some suggestions as to, as to a best way forward. Um, uh, it's really about getting a process going. Uh, there are some, I think, shortcomings in the CPTPP uh, a main agreement in that it, it, it has a kind of a binary process for accession. Um, and there are some good suggestions, including from uh, people in this room. Uh, Hugh Stevens and Jeff Kucharski have written a couple of papers. You can find them on the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada website, also uh, on the, uh, uh, the Canadian Global Affairs Institute uh, website. I would also mention Deborah Elms of the Heinrich Foundation, uh, uh, which was formerly based in Hong Kong, now based in Singapore, which does excellent, excellent work on trade liberalization issues, uh, particularly in, in Asia. And, and basically, the way forward that, that seems the most practical and would be in Canada's interests, I would argue, in Canada's interests as chair to, to advance is is to find some kind of an intermediate process or some kind of an opening step to have a, you know, a, a status of a dialogue partner, a strategic partner, or a kind of a, you probably couldn't call it candidate member in the way that the European Union does, but, but something that would permit a process of discussion to open up where you could get the half dozen applicants uh, together, you know, these things are enormously consuming of, of the time and energy of officials across these different economies, across vast distances. You need to find an efficient way to do that. But, uh, but it, it really needs to get started to have a process where applicants can make their case. And I know, uh, you know, there are, uh, it's a whole separate, you know, day of discussion to discuss the the merits uh, of, of, uh, and the challenges posed by uh, application from the People's Republic of, of China. Um, and I certainly share, you know, I share uh, those concerns, um, um, but uh, it, it would, I would submit it would be consistent with Canada's approach to multilateral affairs to, to play it straight and to say, look, let's have, let's set up a process where uh, applicants can make their case. They can put make their best case for themselves. They can also be subject to scrutiny and and be be asked to explain and, and answer questions from the members. And uh, there are all there's a very wide spectrum of opinion among CPTPP existing members uh, about uh, about China's performance in adhering to its its international obligations. Uh, but there needs to be some way to, to air that. I, I don't see a process. It just seems, we have to, I think we have to face the reality that uh, uh, to move immediately to some kind of process that would lead to admission of Taiwan without consideration of the application of China is something that is 
not going to achieve consensus among CPTPP members. We can get into that in the, in the discussion, but I think we really need to look at practical ways forward, and it's an opportunity for Canada as the chair of the commission of the CPTPP for this calendar year to exercise some creative diplomacy to that end. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, let me ask Dan if he would like to make a few comments. Um, sure, thanks very much, uh, Hugh. And uh, 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 this is a very nice uh, sort of point to end on because I can pick up immediately in, in terms of uh, how to proceed. We know exactly how to proceed. Um, we got to the point where um, Taiwan and, and China are applying to join a WTO-sanctioned Article 24 agreement. Um, we've done that twice, APEC 1991, WTO 2001. Um, it, there is a, a formula that was uh, achieved consensus both uh, within the APEC community uh, in the first case and within the, the much larger WTO community in the second case. They have to come in at the same time, actually, uh, diplomatically with Taiwan second, uh, following uh, China's accession, and that is the only way that it can probably happen. So how do we get there from, uh, from here? That's a problem. So we got to the point where we got Taiwan and China into both APEC and the WTO. This followed, of course, as you all know, the uh, famous uh, Nixon-Kissinger pivot to Asia in uh, 1971, uh, which threw Taiwan, the Republic of uh, China, under the bus diplomatically, but not strategically. Um, the Americans opened up an, uh, an office in Taipei which had exactly the same number of staff as its previous embassy and exactly the same funding just to underscore that point uh, that this was uh, not uh, going to be a, sort of a one-sided relationship. And that led to, that, that particular pivot pinned the Soviet Union, led to the, uh, the, the Cold War resolution in favor of the United States, which then liberated uh, both Lithuania, uh, Estonia, and Latvia, and Ukraine to become independent democracies and led to ultimately, as uh, mentioned, the accession of um, of uh, China and uh, Taipei into the uh, and Taiwan into the, um, uh, into the, the those respective organizations. The problem is we then had in 2009 Obama's pivot to Asia, which unpinned Russia uh, as part of the reallocation of U.S. resources to. Uh, um, basically contain China. That's, that was certainly China, China's interpretation of the pivot. The U.S. pulled out its heavy forces out of Europe. When did that happen? 2013. The last American tanks left Germany. There was a Stars and Stripes article saying, historic moment. What happened immediately thereafter? Crimea. And American generals saying, well, we're not going to go to the nuclear war over Crimea. Of course not. They didn't have their heavy divisions in, or their heavy uh, bombers in, in Europe any longer. That was all gone. The pivot to Asia by Obama unpinned Russia, led to the uh, current war in Ukraine. It also, the Chinese reaction to, be, uh, to the Indo-Pacific strategy that was announced by the Trump administration, okay? This was, again, containment. If you are going to be contained on the, along, uh, the entire, uh, along the entirety of the uh, uh, Pacific and uh, uh, Indian Ocean littoral, you have to go where to secure your energy? You go west. What's west of China? Tehran and Moscow. You have the 25-year agreement with Tehran, and you have the No Limits Pact with, with uh, Moscow. That has been a disaster for the West. It's certainly been a disaster for Ukraine. The uh, invasion of Ukraine, full-scale invasion of Ukraine happened just weeks after uh, the No Limits Pact. So the question is, this, this uh, pivot to uh, Asia, the, the containment of China, which is failing uh, 
abysmally in terms of, of its, uh, the, the, on, on the technological side. This was underscored when Secretary, U.S. Commerce Secretary Raimondo went to China and Huawei unveiled its Mate 60 cell phone with a seven nanometer chip which was developed with workaround technologies because we had, uh, the West had banned uh, the sale of ASML uh, lithography machines to China, but we hadn't banned the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, sort of the next level, and you could use the next level to de develop a seven nanometer chip. China became the world's leading importer of technology in terms of international payments for uh, intellectual property receipts, uh, sort of payments for intellectual property, during this Trump ban on selling uh, technology to China, they hoovered up everything they could buy. And their path to the technological frontier is open. Okay? They did that with uh, we, the, the, the uh, Obama, uh, 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 under Obama, they were blocked from the International Space Station, they built their own. Uh, they built their own GPS system. They, they have the technological chops to do this. So that strategy of somehow uh, uh, blockading China isn't working and is leading to horrific uh, consequences globally that's not in the interest of anyone in this room, certainly. So the path, the question is, how do you get back to where we were in 2008, when, in the last year of George Bush's administration, when he called up both the Chinese premier and the uh, newly elected uh, um, uh, president of, of, of the Republic of China and said, you guys should talk. And six months later, they had the uh, Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement that opened up the new, the three links of direct links uh, between uh, uh, Taiwan and the mainland. And that was the last time that we had actually sort of a reasonable uh, peace in the world. So I think we need to think about how we actually start to change that narrative, how we actually start to, to uh, try and get back to where we used to be, if that is at all possible. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Dan. For the journey through history. Uh, Tim. Okay. Oops. Better. So, um, how, you know, how, how should Canada come at, you know, should we encourage Taiwan to move forward with this process? And if we come to the conclusion that we should, um, how, do we, how do we help? Um, so when we think about you know, who is a potential candidate for, for a free trade agreement? Um, I mean, there, there are plenty of people within my former department who just like any kind of free trade agreement is a good free trade agreement. But the reality is you have limited capacity, um, you have limited you know, bureaucratic capacity, and also have limited political cap uh, capital and limited m ministerial time. So, I mean, there's a couple of things that one, one should look at in, in this respect. The first is the economic benefits, obviously. Um, the size of the economy, um, its presence in global supply chains, um, the complementarity of a, a commodity. You know, are we competitors uh, in, the, in the export space or are we pretty complementary? We tend to, to, to not really compete, but we, we want to buy each other's stuff. Um, and do we already have an FTA agreement with that particular country? Because if we already do, then obviously the benefits are, are much, much less. Um, so we apply that lens to both Taiwan and, uh, and China. Um, Taiwan, it's, it's, it's a significant size economy. It's actually the 21st largest economy in the world. So it's not insignificant. Um, it is an important part of supply chains. Um, and it's very complementary to Canada's economy. We, we don't produce pineapples ourselves. Um, and fortunately, Taiwan doesn't produce a lot of cheese or, or, or milk products, um, at least not for another intense export. To export. Those exactly. <laughs> um, so that'll make people a lot, a lot happier. Um, nor does it have a big auto industry, for instance. So some of the issues that came up with, with TPP um, and CPTPP with, with, uh, with Japan and some of the issues that came up with, with Korea um, won't be an issue here. Um, and frankly, Taiwan is, a, is, a, is an affluent country. It's a rule of law. It's a good country to establish a a relationship with both economic and going beyond that. Uh, and we don't right now have an FTA with Taiwan, although we do have, of course, a FIPA. Um, China, from that perspective, is certainly a, a huge, huge economy, almost, almost too huge, in a sense. Um, even just leaving aside all of the other issues with, with China, <coughs> economy of that size just, would just have impacts across the whole Canadian economy, everything from, from autos um, 
to be basically anything that you can think of. And it would just be just way more complicated. And the China is actually, its GDP is actually bigger than the combined CPP, TPP nations right now. So there's a danger that it could essentially just swamp the whole, the whole agreement. Um, that said, I mean, there'll be obvious advantages to an FTA with China if we actually thought that they were going to stick to it. Um, so that brings you to the second set of considerations, which are, and these are actually ones that the CPP, TPP members have put forward themselves as the three, the three so-called Wellington principles, which essentially you ask yourself, you know, is a deal realistic? Um, and if there is a deal, will the, other, will the parties stick to it? And if you look at the Wellington principles, there's basically th three of them. Um, the first is, are you prepared to undertake high quality, high standards embedded in CPTPP? And here I think you can't just take people's word for it. Of course, uh, countries are going to say that. Um, but you know, have, has the candidate member been readying their economy? Have they been taking the steps to match their legal system, their, their tariff schedules to you know, what the CPP, CPTPP would, would require? And we know that Taiwan has very much been doing that. Um, China has very much not been doing that. Um, you look at SOEs, cross-border flows, procurement, national treatment, uh, labor rights, all of these things are very, very different from how CPTPP manages things, to put, it, to put it politely. And China would essentially have to overhaul its entire approach to its economy if it were to really fit in with the, not just the letter but the spirit of the CPTPP. The second principle is, have you developed, demonstrated success in upholding the trade commitments of past agreements? Um, Taiwan, as far as I know, has been a model citizen, both of the WTO and with respect to its trade agreements with New Zealand and Singapore. Um, has China demonstrated success in upholding trade commitments of past agreements? I, I don't think so. Um, and it was discussed in the previous session. You point to a long track record of misbehavior by China, with respect to Australia, Canada. I, mean, I myself was involved in the dispute in, with, uh, on Canola, which predated the, the two, two Michaels. Um, I mean, the bottom line is China is unwilling to be bound by the rule of law, even within its own country. Um, you know, would it be bound by an international agreement? It's, uh, you know, that doesn't seem too plausible. The third criterion is, is it likely to achieve consensus amongst current members for the creation of a working party? Um, for China, there's a very, very big roadblock in the way, which is Article 32.10 of Kuzma, which says that entry by a party into a free trade agreement with a non-market country, which China is for, the, for these purposes, will allow the other parties to terminate this agreement on six months' notice and replace this agreement, this capital A agreement, with a small a agreement between them, a bilateral agreement. So there's no way that Canada and Mexico are going to jeopardize their trading relationship with their largest partner um, to uh, proceed with a session of China. Okay, it's, just, it's, 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 it's not legally impossible, but politically, economically, it's almost impossible to see. Um, so this is a, a gigantic elephant in the room. Would Taiwan uh, achieve a consensus? That we don't know. I'll come back to that. So how do we proceed? Um, and one of the questions is, what role can Canada play as CPTPP chair this year, moving the process forward? So the Wellington principles are actually, I think, I mean, they've been criticized as being a bit vague, but I, you know, I think they're actually quite sound. I think they're actually a good basis to, 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 to base your process on. Um, but they're not enough. You actually need an actual process. Um, and we have to come up with a way that includes all of the current aspirants. You know, there's some big uh, worries from a Canadian-Mexican standpoint about China, whether China can ultimately succeed. But I don't think you can just say right now um, that China can't exceed uh, a priori. I think we also need to make a last call for other aspirants. I and mean, we have Taiwan, Taiwan, we have Thailand, Indonesia, um, Korea, and the Philippines all have made some sort of signal that they might be interested. I think. We can't, you know, we need to deal with the current group of aspirants. If those other countries want in, they should say so now. And then we need to take the next two years, I think, to, to develop and put into, into effect uh, the process for dealing with, with aspirants under both Canada's leadership this year and then Australia's leadership next year. Um, and then we need to come up with, with this process that's based on the Wellington principles that have been agreed to by all the CPTPP partners. Um, and a process that will allow countries to ultimately move to individualized working groups. And I think the, the proposal that's, that's being put forward for some sort of dialogue group, which is an intermediate step between making an application to be an aspirant and then the, the working party, uh, I think that is an excellent idea. I think it's, 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 I don't see any other way to proceed, really. 
um, right now, um, other than bringing together the, the six aspirants and anybody else who wants to throw in their hat, hat in the ring, um, into this dialogue group from which those countries that are judged to have met the Wellington principles can then graduate. Um, and I think it's, it's also a way, and Dan will have some views on this, but to break that link between, well, I, I put my application in a week before, so you know, my application has to be dealt with before anybody else's, to kind of break that link. Um, and I think this dialogue group, I mean, it should avoid being a dress rehearsal for negotiations. It's not the opportunity to get stuck into pineapples or something, if that's what you really want to do. Um, it should really be where aspirants can, you know, are, are basically being uh, examined on their consistency with the Wellington principles. And that should mean not just commitments that they make, but what is your track record? Um, and it's an opportunity for, for countries, and there'll be many countries around the table that have had experience with, with these aspirants to bring forward issues that they, that they have. And you know, some countries are gonna go through more quickly through this process than, than others. So I think that should be a, a key uh, objective, not just for Canada, but for the, for the other CPTPP countries, to, to set up some sort of process based on the Wellington principles and then it, that process has to be managed, and managed so that countries simply don't all get stuck in it, um, but that there is actually a way forward to emerge from, from that process. Thank you very much, Tim. So uh, some suggestions in terms of the actual mechanics of how it would work. So let's go to our last speaker, and then we'll come back to some questions. Deanna, please. So I agree with everything that's been said already. No. Um, <laughs> So in theory, all countries that could meet all the requirements should be allowed to launch the accession process. So one could argue that Taiwan is ready for accession. It's been working on it for several years. And China will not. This will be a political decision. And we should always also remember China's accession to the WTO. One should not expect that countries will find a way to amend their systems once they get in. Obviously, Canada's support for Taiwan's accession would be well received in Taipei. However, there are other avenues of the support of uh, Taiwan. I agree with the discussion on the intermediate process for applicants. I think it's a good one, but I think Canada should also be encouraging other potential applicants, South Korea in particular, along with India, Philippines, et cetera, to proceed with an application process. I think it's very important that Canada encourage other Indo-Pacific partners to join. If other countries are as ready as Taiwan, there, is a, there could be safety in numbers. Taiwan's intake could com be eventually combined with others, um, but that's kind of a long shot, and perhaps they would attract less attention that way. Um, I don't know whether we're gonna get to a situation such as um, in APEC um, where there was an accommodation made. The fact that Taiwan is shut out of CPTPP and RCEP, uh, the latter at China's behest is significant, but Taiwan does have bilateral cooperation agreements with Singapore and New Zealand, and they're very interesting developments with the U.S. Um, the U.S. concluded the first pay phase of a new trade agreement with Taiwan in May 2023, covering trade facilitation, regulatory practices, service, domestic reg regulation, anti-corruption, supporting small and medium-sized enterprises. So not a, a trade agreement, but um, exactly, but a cooperation mechanism. Um, so now negotiations are finalizing the remaining areas of agriculture, labor, environment, SOEs, digital trade, non-market policies and practices. So this is uh, the U.S.-Taiwan Initiative on 21st Century Trade. It actually replicates many of the provisions and chapters contained in the CPTPP, which the U.S. played a central role in drafting. And it also has also helped accelerate Taiwan's preparations and readiness to join the CPTPP. I find it ironic that while the USA is not a CPTPP member, it is preparing for a bilateral agreement, which is TPP-based, but that's not surprising. So if Canada were to announce its support for Taiwan accession, it would have little meaning unless the other countries can be brought on board. We would have to engage in, the, in Japanese nemawashi, which means circling the route, with all other members to achieve consensus. Japan, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, and even Vietnam 
are particularly important partners since these countries are also economically intertwined with China. That means if we moved ahead, it might prove difficult to punish everybody at once. There are also issues between CPTPP and RCEP in terms of rules of uh, origin, and I wonder how this will impact Taiwan uh, plus CPTPP members. And if this hasn't already been done, Canada could also take the lead on a rules of origin review. Another thing which may be a little bit outside the box, but um, we should be trying to insert ourselves in the USA, Japan, Republic of Korea trilateral cooperation in support of Taiwan, because part of that trilateral agreement is planning for Taiwan contingency. This is in, the, is in the security realm as opposed to trade, but the trade and economic spillover threat to Taiwan is real. Since, and since the USA and Taiwan are working on a bilateral agreement, if it's not being done already, Canada should be studying this very carefully. If the reports of a correlation to CPTPP are real, there could be a possibility that Canada could either sign on to the US agreement or work in parallel. Finally, the Biden administration has, in practical terms, only a few more months to make any progress with Taiwan, and there's a significant risk attached to the outcome of the war in Ukraine. And there's also significant risk of Trump 2.0. If he is indifferent to Taiwan, if it becomes clear that you, the U.S. will not defend Taiwan, China may decide to act, and this is something that we should all care about. <clears throat> Wow, what a, <laughs> what a downer to end on. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, a, gr a great range of comments. Let me just I'll follow up with a couple of uh, questions, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open up. So I want to go to Tim, who talked about uh, some of the mechanics of doing this. Tim, you were involved in uh, the TPTP negotiations. You're a practitioner. Um, so... Uh, I'm just wondering, in terms of, like, if you were the deputy now and Canada's the chair, are there any lessons we can draw from the original process which would be applicable to getting this process moving now with regard to uh, the accession of Taiwan in particular, but also dealing with China and the other applicants? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, I mean, this is obviously a very different kind of negotiation, a very different situation from putting it together in the first place. I mean, last time the real challenge was the, the domestic interests in different countries. Um, no one was particularly worried about annoying China at that moment. I mean, it all seems so, <laughs> so very, very long ago. Um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, I mean, CPTPP as well, it's a plurilateral agreement. It's, it's a very disparate group. I mean, frankly, it'd be harder to find 12 countries <laughs> who are more different in many ways, all at different levels of development. We now have one that's actually an Atlantic country rather than a Pacific country. Um, and that was true um, back a few years ago when I was very much involved in these negotiations. Um, so how do, you, how do you drive, you know, how do you herd those cats? And at the end of the day, someone has to drive it. Somebody big and important has to drive it. The U.S. drove TPP. They drove those negotiations along. Um, and then when the U.S. pulled out, uh, the Japanese took over that role, by and large. Um, CPTPP was essentially driven by Japan, I think, with, with Australia and New Zealand uh, as, its, as its lieutenants. Um, and this time, if we're going to move forward, CPTPP is going to move forward with a, with a proper process and potentially graduate some, some new members beyond the UK. Um, I think probably you know, Japan, um, aided and abetted by, by Canada, and it's probably Australia. I mean, it's probably the, those three countries that have the economic and political clout um, and also the, the capacity uh, as well and the institutional memory. Um, UK is a bit of a newcomer. It's not in the region in the same way the other countries are. You know, I, I wonder if they, they have the capacity for this. Um, and of course, Australia will be the next chair after Canada. So y you need somebody you know, who's committed to moving this along. Um, timing is, is a challenge as well. Um, you know, it, 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 these things are very time consuming, getting everybody together is, is, is you know, crossing many, many time zones. Um, you can use, I mean, one good piece of good news here is we, we didn't really make use of Zoom or any of those kinds of tools um, last time around. Um, I think you could, you could now. And I think as well, 
you know, when you're negotiating an agreement, you've got all of these tables going on. Um, I think for this, you know, this dialogue group process, you, the dimensionality of the problem is, is significantly less, and I think that will, that will help. Um, and, you know, I think, just talking about being in the driving seat, I mean, the other key actor here will be the United States, you know, as, as, as was said. And, you know, the view that you know, the U.S. will, will take a, about this, I mean, last time, you know, I, U.S. had pulled out, you had the Trump administration, um, certainly didn't smile on CPTPP, but now did they view CPTPP as, as, a, as a particular threat? Um, I mean, perhaps they, they should have done, um, certainly from an economic standpoint, the fact that we have, you know, CPTPP with these countries, countries like Japan, countries like Vietnam, and the and U.S. doesn't is, is, is a negative for their, for their groups, but for, for the U.S. The, and under the previous president, and I suspect going forward, it'll be the geopolitical um, considerations that weigh more than, I think, the, the narrow economic ones. And that'll be the big question for you know, whoever wins in November. Do they view you know, Taiwan becoming you know, more intertwined with CPTPP? Do they view that as in U.S.'s interests or not? And you know, that's hard to call. Um, you know, they may say, you know, we don't like CPTPP, we don't like trade deals, we don't want, um, you know, to, to boast the CPTPP, We've, we're going to have our own deal with Taiwan, and so, you know, the last thing we want is, is Taiwan, you know, doing a deal with other people, or they may take the opposite view. They may say, you know, the more that, you know, we can set up CPTPP as a, in opposition to RCEP, um, the more we can have this kind of non-China-led process be, be bolstered, the more that Taiwan's own position gets bolstered, the, be the better for the U.S., so that will be, I think, a, a very important part, piece of the puzzle. Thank you. Thanks to think about. Uh, Dan, you, uh, you, you talked in your remarks about the sort of the, the broad strategic landscape, but you're also an economist and have done a lot of modeling on uh, FTAs. Uh, I'm just wondering if you've done any modeling on the impact of Taiwan's accession uh, both for Canada-Taiwan relationships and its broader impact on the region as a whole. Uh, if so, could you comment on that? Uh, sure, thanks, Hugh. Um, we did actually model uh, the accession of Taiwan uh, to the uh, TPP, the TPP-12, including the, the United States. And it's a really big win for, uh, for Taiwan in terms of the uh, GDP gain, but that was largely driven by the membership of the United States, and that would have been because the, liberalized, the mean liberalizing bilateral was U.S.-Taiwan. Uh, um, what's interesting um, about the accession to uh, a plurilateral agreement is that some parties will have already uh, have a, 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 a bilateral trade agreement and others won't, right? So there's a trade creation and, a, and, and an income creation effect from the li overall liberalization, which benefits the exceeding party disproportionately. Mm -hmm. But there is trade diversion effects, which then, especially for some of the, the countries which have got relatively small uh, trade relations, say, with the exceeding party, they will have negative effects. So if you look at our study, uh, which was from 2014 or, or so, um, Canada actually had minor negative welfare impact from uh, Taiwan's accession. Uh, and so did about four or five other um, uh, incumbent members of the agreement. So that sets up then a problem for uh, getting consens uh, uh, consensus on uh, accepting the member. If you take a look at the UK, the UK's uh, government's own um, uh, assessment of the uh, uh, impact of accession was it would have an impact on UK GDP of about, what, 0.6%, uh, 0.06%, uh, very small, <coughs> and <coughs> the... 0.08%. Okay, there you go. The, um, the, but so the question would be, and, and we haven't seen the, uh, the, the very detailed, I haven't seen the, the very detailed impacts on the other uh, parties, but my presumption is that there would be very minimal impacts on the other parties in a negative sense from trade diversion, and probably the, the trade creation would have left them okay. So there wasn't any uh, built-in resistance to the UK joining the CPTPP. That may be a, a, a rather different story with, um, with, say, Taipei and certainly with China. Um, 
So if uh, you know, there are parties that have got free trade agreements uh, as of now with, with, uh, with, uh, tai with Taiwan, so they would face preference erosion. And so you can't predict. You would have to run the models, again, from uh, an updated basis from where we are right now to see actually what would be the impact. But you can certainly count on the fact that many of those countries will be running the numbers themselves and checking to see how their interests are being impacted. And they will be taking positions based upon that to see whether or not they can actually then, through uh, a you know, bilateral uh, initiatives with the exceeding party get something to offset any negative impacts. Uh, so that, that would be the expected um, sort of process within capitals, and it's not assuring that there would be um, ex uh, sort of accepted. I just, Jeff Schott back in, I think, 2013 was commenting on, uh, he's a, he's a well, very well-known American uh, a trade analyst, he commented on how rarely accession clauses are actually utilized uh, in trade agreements precisely because of this particular problem, so. You said that um, Canada would have a slightly negative effect if Taiwan joined. That presumably was because Taiwan would get a piece of the U.S. market, right? So since, since it's, the U.S. is out, that, that negative is gone. And in terms of uh, diversion effects on other TC, CPTPP members, only two small economies, one is Singapore and one is New Zealand. So I'm assuming that the, the benefits would far outweigh any diversionary negatives. The, the big one for Canada probably would be Japan. Uh, so if, uh, because we would then see our preferences in Japan eroded vis-a-vis -vis mm. Taiwan. So mm. it's not a shoe in uh, but we would have to run the numbers again. Good. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, Jeff, um, as the, you, you just spent a lot of time in, 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 uh, in the region. Um, the APFC is playing a big part in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, and the CPTPP is kind of baked into the Indo-Pacific strategy. So uh, could you talk, from your perspective, uh, from, the, from the Foundation's perspective, what role do you see uh, the CPTPP and its accession playing as part of the rollout of the, uh, the Canada sort of coming back to Asia and the IPS? Uh, very happy to do that, Hugh. Um, uh, just a, a, a quick comment um, on the, the, you know, the issues around uh, the potential accession of China. I just want to underline, uh, we, should, we should not minimize the complexities and the challenges that are associated with that. And this, uh, um, Tim mentioned the, the clause uh, 3210 in the, in the uh, Canada-US-Mexico uh, trade agreement. Um, this is not just a theoretical discussion, uh, Republican Senator Tom Cotton has actually already a few months ago sent a public letter to the U.S. Trade Representative asking her to invoke that clause to prevent Canada or, and or Mexico from, uh, from uh, you know, encouraging uh, China's accession to CPTPP. So this is, you know, the game's afoot on that. And I think if you look at the complexities, you just need to think for a, a, a moment about the auto sector and just think how complicated that would that could could become. Um, yeah, in, in terms of in terms of the CPTPP and and uh, everything that Canadians will be seeking to do under the Indo-Pacific strategy, I think it's uh, I think it is it is uh, it does have an important role to play. Um, we have uh, trade relationships with some of the partners in CPTPP that are that are, uh, you know, below potential for us to, to do more. Uh, Vietnam comes to mind and is, you know, is, is on a lot of people's minds these days, a great, a great potential. And there will be a trade mission uh, to Vietnam, uh, uh, a Team Canada trade mission that uh, Trevor's getting on a plane later tonight to join. And, and uh, we're actually gonna do a follow-up uh, women's uh, business mission in the fall to, to Vietnam. Um, so I think there is, uh, on the one hand, there is an agenda to um, uh, really uh, explore the, the opportunities and to bring to light for Canadians the opportunities that arise from these, uh, these trade agreements that we have in the region that were, that were hard won. Tim, Tim, I'm sure, has the scars to, to prove that. Um, and, um, and I would not, uh, by the way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit that only to CPTPP. We also have our FTA with uh, South Korea. Uh, lots of potential there and lots of interest, organic interest across Canadian private sector and, 
and academic institutions, uh, civil society for, for Canada to do more with, uh, with Korea and within our CPTP, CPTPP partners. There's also new energy in the Japan relationship. So uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of practical work to be done there uh, to leverage the, the opportunities from those trade agreements, some of which, if you look at the market opportunities for Canadians in Japan, these things, some of the most meaningful aspects of this are phased in over a very long period of time. But that means, you know, next year, you know, two years after that, another year after that, new opportunities are, will be arising for Canadian businesses. So there's a practical agenda. On the policy side, our, uh, within our, our team at Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, on the research side now led by our new uh, Vice President uh, for Research and Strategy, Vina Najibullah, who was, um, it's pertinent to say, quoted in the Globe and Mail this morning, uh, talking about uh, Taiwan accession issues. That was actually an interview that was conducted uh, about a month ago. Um, so Avina uh, is leading uh, the, our team in doing uh, short and longer reports that you can see on our website uh, uh, today uh, at uh, www.asiapacific.ca, um, including work by our network of distinguished fellows, uh, three of whom are on the, are on the stage uh, here, Dan, Deanna, and Hugh. Jonathan Freed is, uh, is here. There, there may be another, I don't know if we have any others in the, in the room. Um, but uh, this, this will be an important part of an agenda, but we're framing it, we will be framing this more broadly under the rubric of economic security and, a, and a, a baskets of related issues around supply chain, resilience, uh, issues around cybersecurity, um, uh, and uh, di trade diversification. Um, as a matter of, of, uh, of economic strategy for, for Canada. Um, and so we, this will be uh, a big part of our research agenda going forward, as well as the convening, and these are the things that we do, for those of you who don't know us uh, as APF Canada, the convening of events, our, our, what is now our annual uh, Canada and Asia conference in, uh, in Singapore, um, events that we organize across Canada. We're looking specifically to organize something at the trade ministerial meeting in Peru in May on the margins of, of that. We have a role as the Secretariat for Canada for the APEC Business Advisory uh, Council, which is a kind of private sector official counterpart to, to APEC, um, to the intergovernmental process at APEC. And we're also looking at doing events in Canada uh, later this year focusing on uh, CPTPP, and then uh, towards the end of this year, um, we have a plan to open a regional office uh, in, in Asia. Uh, the working assumption is that will be in Singapore. We're still working on the arrangements, the funding arrangements uh, with uh, Global Affairs Canada, but we'd like to do something in Southeast Asia before the end of the year uh, that would have a focus on, on CPTPP. So it's, it's gonna be, uh, you're gonna see a lot of it in our in our uh, products and in the discussions that, that we convene, and we're looking forward to working with all of you in this room on those things. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, finally, Diana, um, as I mentioned in your bio, you spent a lot of time in Japan and uh, in Vietnam, both of whom, of course, are important CPTPP members, both of whom have close relations, economic relations with China, but difficulties also in that relationship. So I'm just wondering, based on your uh, knowledge of those countries, what role do you think these two economies will play with regard to the accession of Taiwan and China uh, in, this, uh, in this current round? Uh, I'm going to go back to the previous panel a little bit uh, because I think, um, I don't think either country, given the current geopolitical situation, I don't think either country will m want to make a decision this year. In in spite of any encouragement they get from Canada. I think a lot will depend on the US election results. Um, Vietnam works hard to keep its stance of neutrality and is very dependent on Chinese trade and investment because you have to remember that, first of all, um, a lot of Chinese companies are also moving into Vietnam due to higher labor costs in China and uh, then you have other countries that are investing in Vietnam as part of their China plus one strategy or China or minus China strategy. 
Um, so there's that. Uh, Japan is in the allied camp, i.e. West with the U.S., from a security perspective, but it's also very dependent on the Chinese market. So China, Japan will also try to avoid making a firm commitment. On the other hand, Ch Japan also has historic ties to Taiwan and a lot of economic relationships there. So leveraging opportunities for Canada in these countries. So um, trade agreements uh, are not as relevant for things like digitally driven services and things like that, uh, on services in general. Um, so I think that there is a lot that can be done outside of a trade agreement uh, framework. Um, and I think that's why countries are, are working on things that don't necessarily involve market access or changing tariffs or things like that. Um, but I will also reiterate um, that the key in all of this is that we really do have to work together. And Canada needs to be able to bring, along, bring others on side if we want to proceed. We can't proceed alone. It doesn't have a lot of meaning. And there's no point in saying we're planning on doing X when we don't have the others alongside. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes left. If anybody wants to uh, raise a question directly to any of the panelists, I invite you to go to the mic. Craig? I'll try something that occurred to me as I was listening to everyone. It's in essence a uh, comedy and how is this all going to play out with the elephants in the room, both the U.S. and China, and the evisceration of the WTO, which is perhaps an overstatement, but you can each speak to it. I, I'm just interested in how we're going to bring some of these together and can they move forward? And, and my quick thoughts are the Cosma Clause that I like to call, the 3210, I like to call it the, our vassal state clause. Uh, Vietnam joining uh, an FTA with the U.S., is a basis for us to do the same to the U.S. and find out what the rules of the game are that we could then use against them with China. I, it's an observation. I'd just like the panelists to react to that. Uh, the others are, are really simple ones. A small agreement that might be done in the short term versus getting the World Trade Organization working with rules that everybody follows, particularly the big powers, is, is that elephant in the room. I, I don't know whether it's possible. I wonder about the EU and how you see it going, and I just individuals, and s secondly, India, and then th third, last again to you to decide, Hugh, but perhaps Kelly might li like to speak to those issues as well in terms of da Taiwan's perspective. Wow, who wants to take on uh, those questions? Tim, go ahead, Tim. I can maybe, uh, maybe start. Um, I mean, we could certainly be he here all day with a lot of them, so just this would just be very, much quicker answers than they, they deserve. Um, on the, I think you said the vassal state clause, um, I mean, I was also involved in, in COSMA as well as CPTPP. The Americans are very insistent on this. I mean, as was said, that this is not theoretical for them. Um, and of course, you know, non-market economy, I mean, that's a convenient way to, to identify China. Um, I don't think they're particularly worried that, that Vietnam is not a non-market economy because Vietnam, by and large, is played by the, the international trade rules. Um, so you know, the, the Americans are very, very serious about that. I mean, I think even moving to some sort of halfway house, I mean, we will have a fair amount of explaining to do to, to, to the Americans. Um, and obviously, that is our number one trading relationship by far. And whoever wins in November, I expect the Americans to continue enthusiastically building that wall um, with the rest of the world that they are essentially doing. And so, you know, at the end of the day, Canada will need to be inside that wall and do what we need to do. I mean, can we have it both ways a bit, as we are with CPTPP and COSMA? Yes, but um, we'll have to be very careful about it. WTO, um, I mean, the negotiation function has been broken for a very long time. Um, basically, the Doha round is, is, I mean, nothing has really come of the Doha round. So that's like 20 years worth of, of more than 20 years worth of work. Um, the uh, dispute resolution function has essentially ground to a halt, um, at least, you know, for those countries that don't believe in, including the U.S. Um, and, you know, there was some optimism after Biden uh, administration came to power, but no, the Americans have just continued on the same path. Um, they refused to allow that uh, to be resuscitated. Um, 
And then maybe, I mean, India, and this relates a bit to the, to the earlier discussion. Um, I mean, Indo-Pacific is an American um, uh, formulation, and it's very much serving American geopolitical interests. Um, Canada's economic interests in Indi India are not huge. Um, there are, I know, I know India's a very fast-growing economy, um, but it's not an economy that, that fundamentally, the Indians don't think of themselves, I think, as, 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 as free traders, are dependent on trade, at least, the way, the way Canada does. I think, I, I think no one would dissent from that. And they see themselves as this big continental economy. They have this made in India strategy. I mean, they're not free traders, really, I think, by temperament. And so it's very hard to have a free trade agreement with a country that doesn't actually really believe in free trade. Um, there may be good geopolitical reasons to have some sort of agreements, but I think from, from, from a Canadian standpoint, it's you know, Southeast Asia and North Pacific. I mean, those are the big gains for us. And as has been said, countries like Vietnam, like Japan, I mean, those are the places that I think that Canada can really um, derive significant economic benefit going forward. Dan, do you want to comment on WTO at all? Not really. I don't think I Deanna? Yeah. Um, since uh, Vietnam was mentioned, I will comment. Um, for many of the younger people in this room, um, they might not know this, but Canada actually uh, gave technical assistance to Vietnam in, for the WTO uh, accession. And Vietnam has been subject to a lot of U.S. trade uh, remedy actions, uh, but they have worked hard in, in order to meet the requirements. Uh, so I think we're probably, I think that even from the American perspective, and now that the U.S. is now a strategic partner, uh, it's been elevated by Vietnam to be one of the three top, um, I think that uh, that will continue, that they will continue to engage as much as possible uh, with Vietnam. Um, and just a quick comment on India. When I was doing research, um, I was mapping Canadian company presence in Asia. India consistently was lower than what one would expect. Um, there is no doubt that it is a difficult market to, to enter and um, they, we always hope that things will get better, and now that we have a political challenge on our relationship, uh, I don't expect anything, any great news on that front soon. Thank you. Next question. Have to lower it a little bit. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wendy Wu. I am the East Asian and Latino Outreach Lead at uh, the Liberal Research Bureau. Uh, just a few weeks ago, um, actually, Ambassador Harris uh, Sen um, braved our parliamentarians about the Taiwan election um, and the pre and post uh, interference of China. I want to see if things go south, that Taiwan is not eventually accepted to CP <coughs> CPTPP, uh, what other strategies will Canada take uh, to help uh, Taiwan access the global market while respect the one China policy that uh, China recognizes itself? Thanks. Volunteers? Jeff? Well, I, I think um, it's, you know, the, the CPTPP, CPTPP discussion is about Canada uh, kind of exercising influence on other countries to make something possible for Taiwan, you know, to join a, um, a regional uh, agreement. It's actually kind of supra-regional now that, now that the UK is there. Um, but um, there's, there's nothing that says that Canada can't do more on a bilateral basis, and, and there, there are all kinds of possibilities in, in, in kind of technical measures that, that would not, um, on the face of it, would not um, sort of stray into, into areas that, that would seem to change the status of a kind of a state-to-state -state relationship in a way that would be problematic um, with the PRC. Um, so I, I think, uh, I, and I would just say this is not something that needs to wait on whether, on whether Taiwan gets into CPTPP or not. I think, as we've just heard, the most you know, optimistic scenarios. This is years. This would be years in, in coming. There's, um, uh, you know, there are other things that can be done to encourage uh, a deeper economic uh, cooperation. And, uh, and you, you know, um, uh, the possibility of trade missions has been mentioned. Um, we will be doing 
a, a, a modest version of a, of a trade mission um, uh, for, uh, for women-led businesses. Um, but, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things in a positive agenda that can be done to, uh, to encourage a, a deeper economic cooperation. And as Canadians, and I, I think it hasn't been said enough, I know Hugh, you mentioned, but I mean, it's, you know, this all depends on companies, ultimately. It's, it's the private sector, ultimately, that makes these choices. So it's, the, it's for the Canadian corporate sector, um, and then with support from government, with government helping to provide tools where there's a role for, for government and public agencies to play, to, to help to set the table for Canadian companies and their counterparts and potential partners in Taiwan to, to deepen their, their cooperation. So I think there's, there's a range of things that can be done and it's not a, this is not by any means a binary proposition. It, it should not be all or nothing Taiwan into CP, TPP or not. Uh, our relationship can, can move ahead uh, in the absence of that and, and maybe in the hope that it could happen someday. Would anybody else like to comment? Maybe. Sure. I mean, look, the, ge the geopolitical environment is, is changing, changing fast. Um, I mean, look what happened with Hong Kong, for instance. Um, so, you know, could, could you rule out a, a Canada-Taiwan FTA in three, four years' time in a world in which the Americans had done something similar, in which the battle lines had really hardened between a U.S.-led coalition and, and China? Uh, I don't think you could. I mean, we have an FTA with Israel we've had for a long time. That wasn't based on the massive economic benefits of doing trade with, with Israel. Um, similarly with the Canada-Ukraine. Um, and the Americans in particular have, have almost always used their FTAs. Um, those FTAs have, have usually been driven by political rather than economic uh, interests. Um, so, you know, there are some, some bilateral mechanisms that can, can come into play, but it is going to depend very much on what, you know, what the world look like, looks like. But, you know, the ideal, I think, for, for Canada is, is um, to use the CPTPP as, as the way to expand our, our, trading, um, uh, you know, our trading presence, because it is a, a high-quality plurilateral agreement. And, you know, as I said before, the WTO is on very hard times, and I think the CPTPP is, is the only game in town for anything broader than bilateral agreements, and that those have never been in Canada's int ultimate interests. Um, you know, the, the U.S. likes kind of the hub and spoke model, of course, but but we don't. Um, so, you know, as I say, the world is an uncertain place, and we'll see what happens. Thank you. <coughs> Next question. No, sorry, Dan. I think Dan wanted to get in. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, just to build on that, I think that you know bilateral deals, uh, which are uh, sort of sanctioned under the WTO uh, membership sort of uh, framework, are fully wide open. The problem with CPTPP is that there are uh, 11 members there. And if, if we were just to, uh, we haven't mentioned Singapore, for example, but if you listen to Singapore's commentary on uh, sort of relations and, and non-confrontation uh, within the Asia Pacific, Singapore would probably block just because they want to see the region develop in a, uh, in, in, in a non-confrontational manner. So Canada, the U.S. could uh, enter into an FTA with, uh, with Taiwan independently, um, in, and probably, you know, even sort of other members of the Asia-Pacific region, like ASEAN, could do so independently without raising this issue of uh, a, a block confrontation. So that would be my, my observation is, especially if, if, as Tim says, you know, things harden uh, and, and that's the, the path along which they are going right now, you could do bilaterals. And certainly business relationships are wide open. Um, uh, you know, the deputy foreign minister mentioned a lot of the, the business relationships. This is an area where firm-to-firm -firm contact and firm-to-firm -firm development, especially in technology sectors, Canada's got a lot of really good technology startups. We just don't scale them up very well. Certainly, that's an area that Taiwan has done extra extremely well at doing. And so partnerships in that area would both work to uh, improve the economic functioning of the two economies, develop technology, which would be 
world uh, leading um, and would certainly improve our own uh, economic security down the line, that should be pursued with all vigor uh, possible. Looks like there's two questions. Please, next question. Hi, uh, my name is Shu Yu. I'm from the uh, University of Ottawa studying political science. And uh, my question is that, uh, so you mentioned in like WTO and uh, APEC, uh, which both accept uh, Taiwan and China as their member. And uh, I think uh, uh, CPTPP, uh, CPTPP may be doing the same thing. Uh, but my, my idea is that uh, uh, because compared to like uh, APEC and WTO time, China now is more the stronger uh, economy and more aggressive on uh, uh, diplomacy. So I worry CPTPP members maybe will only accept China but reject Taiwan because China is obviously more important on economy than Taiwan in this case. And China is also implementing the strategy to isolate Taiwan in many international organizations, like kind of a coercion. So under this situation, what suggestions does the panel would like to give Taiwan short term and long term like uh, to help Taiwan overcome this kind of dilemma or uh, challenge. Thank you. I and think go ahead. <laughs> I think as as we've been talking about, I don't think anybody is anxious to make this decision um, anytime soon. And yes, we do have um, APEC was very clever in developing the concept of member economies. Um, as opposed to countries for a number of reasons. Um, but there's no doubt that um, China is the elephant in the room and Canada will just have to work hard to build a consensus with, his, with its other countries. And I don't know whether that is possible, but certainly if you take it from the Asian perspective, generally speaking, confrontation avoidance is one of um, that that is kind of how ASEAN works and I remember um, former senior official for APEC uh, des describing APEC meetings as a lot of talk that ends in hugs <coughs> so perhaps that perhaps that will be the ongoing um, modus operandi for a CPTPP as well we can we can play this out for a long time and I have a feeling that there will be workarounds for Taiwan. You just, just very quickly, I, just, I, I would just say I, I really think the scenario of a China accession without a Taiwan accession is extremely unlikely uh, for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. But if you just think about CPTPP members, including Canada and Mexico, uh, you know, Japan, Australia, I, I, just, don't, I yeah. just don't see it uh, as a realistic uh, possibility. Okay, we're running short on time, but we have one question. And I, uh, Deputy Minister also uh, is in a position to ask the last question. So, <laughs> Madam, would you go ahead, please? My name is Dr. Amal. I'm President and Chief Executive Officer of Canada Heritage Action Foundation. And as the African continent awake to a new era, Africa with its huge natural resources seeks to equitable partnerships with the global community, rather than the relation that mirrors self-serving leadership. For Egypt, the appeal of China gathers about mutual respect and partnerships on equality. So is there any possibilities, equi equitable partnerships between Canada, Taiwan, and Egypt in the future that foster economic security and respect the continent sovereignty? Thank you. Would anyone like to take that one on? Um, sure, I'm happy to happy to talk to that. And you know, it, it's 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 interesting. I mean, often with the Canadian audience, you know, we think about Europe, and we think about we think about well, I guess it used to be called the Far East, now called the Asia Pacific, and then you know we have also India as well because of the large diaspora community uh, there. Um, but we forget that the you know the African continent is is growing fast and. Um, you know, there's a lot of things to like about, about Taiwan and other countries in the region like Japan or, or Korea, but they have very low fertility rates, and that's not true in, in, in Africa. In fact, um, I think many people may know that uh, last year India overtook China as the world's most populous nation. But also in that year, the continent of Africa overtook India 
Um, if, if Africa were one country, it would be the world's most populous country. Um, so I think you know Africa in general, and then of course the challenge with Africa is it isn't it isn't one country. I mean there's an African Union, but it's certainly not an economic bloc. Uh, but then looking there, and what are what are some of the economies there that are you know worth 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 cozying up to in some ways? <laughs> um, Egypt is certainly one of the key uh, economies in 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 Africa, and of course it's also one of those economies that a bit like Turkey it sort of straddles a couple of regions as as well. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, there's certainly some, some local <laughs> security issues going on in, in that part of the world. But, but I, I, I agree. I think, you know, I think from a, a Canadian perspective, um, you, know, we, you know, we shouldn't just drown out the rest of the world. Um, but I think as well from a Taiwanese perspective, obviously, you know, I don't want to, to give them advice, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I'll speak for them. But I suspect, you know, forming partnerships with some of these emerging countries that are growing quite fast, um, certainly in, in demographic terms, um, you know, is, is probably a good long-term, smart long-term investment. Thank you. So, Dan, uh, uh, Dan, I think Dan. yes, sure, Dan. Sorry, yeah. um, I do have the <coughs> distinction of probably being the only person to uh, qu quantitatively model uh, Canada-Africa relations, and. Uh, uh, for the whole continent, and actually came up with, with uh, 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 an Africa discount. If you take into account sort of normal grav economic gravity relationships, population size, economy size, there's about 25% or so less trade between Canada and African just because they're in Africa. So yeah, there's a lot that we could probably do to improve um, our, our uh, trade with Africa. It, Tim, as Tim said, it's, it's both uh, growing in population-wise and in terms of economy. It's got a lot of resources. One area where, in fact, I mean, if you were to, to just kind of, you know, blue sky thinking about sort of a, a Canada-Taiwan uh, sort of joint effort in, in Africa would be, of course, in technology. Um, Africa is becoming a sort of a Chinese lake in terms of technology. Um, and one reason is because the West doesn't have on offer those particular services. Um, whether it's, you know, the leading cell phone uh, in, in Africa is a, a, a relatively little known uh, Chinese brand, I think it's called or something, uh, but the reason why they captured the African market was because they uh, tailored their uh, camera on the cell phone to capture dark faces, and they, and they, 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 they dominate that market. Um, so there is, there's a question of technology, 5G, 6G technology. Um, so the world needs a, count, a sort of an, an alternative to Huawei. Okay, Canada used to be, have that. That was called Nortel before we let it go. But we certainly have, have the, the technology and if, if you were to talk about a partnership, uh, Taiwan would be an ideal partner to try and develop uh, that kind of technology that would be a competitive alternative and that would in fact be attractive potentially to, to, to many African economies from Egypt, uh, from Cairo to Cape Town. Thank you, Dan. Um, if there are no other comments from the panel, I'll ask, uh, I will give the last word to Deputy Minister Xie. Thank you, Hugh. And, and this is a wonderful, hi, Craig, <laughs> wonderful uh, panel. I don't have questions because I, I don't want to keep people from, uh, from, from lunch. Uh, but uh, just two, ob two, two comments. Uh, uh, one is about uh, uh, the possibility or feasibility of China's accession, you know, what kind of roadblocks down the road. And I would just want, want to add my experience in the UK. Um, the, the UK currently is in the process of rectifying the agreement itself. So I, uh, based on the discussions on the both chambers of the parliament, uh, I can certainly see that uh, 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 the, imme the, Im the discussion, the immediate part of the discussion will popping out would be on what does it mean for the UK with regard to the potential application of China? What kind of position the, United, uh, the UK should, uh, should take? And the impression I got is, is, is that, um, uh, especially on the House of Lords uh, and some members, MPs, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, MPs, they, they, they concerned whether um, the UK uh, will be able to, um, in a way, stop China's succession. 
So that's the concern, that's the sentiment there in, in the UK, as so far as I, I can understand it. So that's another roadblock, I would say, uh, when uh, the UK finally becomes a former member, the 12th member, uh, early, as early as uh, uh, next year. Uh, another thing is about uh, uh, the, the, the comment on uh, uh, drawing analogy uh, or as a pass uh, from the WTO uh, accession uh, process and APAC even. Uh, but I, I would stress again that uh, from our perspective, from Taiwan's perspective, the applications of Taiwan and also the applications of China should be uh, taken as two independent cases because exactly because of our experience in WTO. Um, um, uh, I, 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 I would remind the audience that uh, uh, Taiwan uh, tendered its application for GATT at the time uh, in 1991, uh, and then uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, crucial uh, support from the United States then, very quickly, a working group uh, was formed for Taiwan's accession discussions. And it took us about six, uh, five years, so by 1996, Taiwan finished more than 40 or 50 rounds of bilaterals. And then we were told to wait for China to conclude their bilaterals. How long did we wait for? Five, another five years. Uh, so we, we eventually, yes, joined uh, WTO at the same time, roughly, maybe 15 minutes apart on the same day with China. Uh, but it took us another five years just to wait for. So we were held hostage. Uh, to that process. I don't want to see uh, that kind of experience being repeated uh, in, in the current geopolitical situation. And, and so uh, I, this is just a comment uh, for, for, for the audience to, uh, to uh, I want to share with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for your patience. Thank you to our panel for some really interesting insights on this question. There are clearly paths forward, but they're not straight paths. They're complicated paths. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, but uh, the conclusion I draw is that it's, uh, it's doable. Uh, it's just a question of uh, letting the other pieces fall into place and uh, having a bit of backbone and a bit of spine uh, to be prepared to move ahead. Anyway, lunch, I believe, is served. Is that right, Bijan? Yeah. So uh, again, thank you very much. It's been a very interesting morning, and uh, bon appétit.